Hello. Uh, today we are going to be talking about two um, kinds of therapy that will be integrated in the student presentation, the model presentation that Natalie is doing this week. Um, and those are solution-focused therapy and narrative therapy. And in our book, um, Dr. Metcalf, who is the author, talks about her model, which is to integrate those two. Um, and that's the chapter that you read for this week. But I'm going to talk about each of these models individually. They share some commonalities, and so they are key, good for integrating. Um, but they are standalone models also. So here we go. Um, so some of the theoretical underpinnings that work for both of them, uh, these models are both postmodern, meaning well with Bowen and with structural family therapy, those both had this kind of understanding that reality is reality and what people assume is reality is reality and what the therapist sees and what the client tells them really represents what is. And postmodern sense of reality is different and I will go a little bit more into that in a bit, but basically um, in a postmodern perspective, reality isn't just whatever you think and um, it is actually constructed. So that is key for both solution focused and narrative therapy. Uh, social constructionism is one of the ways that reality is created. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later too. Um, briefly, it's the idea that the narratives and the words and the language that we use help create reality. If you all speak another language, you might notice that in another language, kind of different, there's a different feeling to it, a different, different things are stressed. Um, it, it does kind of create a different reality, maybe even a different sense of yourself. And so that brings us to the next, which is that words matter. And both solution-focused therapy and narrative therapy, their, their very change mechanisms have to do with the words that are used, the way things are talked about. Um, so that's really key for both of these. Another thing is that both of these models came as kind of a response to um, older models, you might have remembered Bowen really thought highly of psychodynamic therapists. Um, and psychodynamic therapy is a very long term therapy. Um, and so there was a group that decided, why do we need to be doing this for two years, people need relief from these symptoms or from these problems really quickly. And so um, there's a group called the Mental Research Institute or MRI that formed. Um, there's also kind of a sister organization in Milan. And they worked on coming up with a brief therapy. So from those uh, institutes were, came strategic therapy and then um, Milan therapy. And those are also standalone therapies. We are not going over them this semester. They are not at the top of my favorite models list. So even though they are important models, um, other than kind of briefly talking about them in comparison to um, solution focused and narrative, we're not gonna really go over them. Um, so brief is better was an understanding that the creators of both of these models had. And so they looked at a different set of parameters. So for both Bowen and Mnuchin, they were really interested in where the problem was coming from. What was getting stuck? What was the structure or what was the history or how was anxiety managed? And of course, all of those things were reality. Uh, for solution-focused therapy and for narrative therapy, 
they are much less interested in what happened before. In fact, they might not even ask what brings you in to therapy, tell me about the problem. They will instead be future focused and um, talking about solutions and about what you want, what reality you want to create. And the way they did therapy, and again, this is, you know, the, um, all of these models are kind of an expression of the person or people who created them. So the way they did therapy, they just said, you know what, let's not worry about everything that got us here. Let's work from here forward. And it doesn't matter, like we're not gonna find one particular solution for that problem. We're just gonna do whatever works. And um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, social constructionism. So I really like this graphic here. Uh, I like the way that um, it, this gear uh, inside the person's head maybe could represent their version of reality. And then these bigger gears are like societal versions of reality, cultural versions of reality, maybe family versions of reality. And so they impact each other, but the idea of reality really is created by the people it's this kind of common um common perspective and one of the things michael white liked to point out michael white was the um original creator with of uh, narrative therapy he worked with um, david epstein um anyway he liked to point out that all, a lot of the things that we talk about having like i have you know, maybe we have personal resources or these relationship dynamics or um, even things like anxiety. We talk about these a lot, but those weren't even a thing. Like they weren't reality. They didn't exist until there was kind of social um, happenings and movements that brought those into the kind of collective consciousness and gave them a name and a definition and a different culture or a different society sees those things very differently. It's not the same reality. Um, that's one of the things that is important for culturally sensitive therapy is just recognizing that maybe in a different culture, depression is super, super shameful, or maybe uh, trauma and responses of trauma are thought of as possession or demons or something like that. And so um, again, these realities are just very different. However, this is one of the important things, the reality that we live in, you know, the gears all mesh in society, that feels like truth to us. It feels like it really is real. It really is true. And um, we get stuck. Stuckness is something that, you know, Bowen talked a little about a little bit. Definitely Mnuchin talked about being stuck. He was talking about being stuck in a structure, but um, in both solution focused and narrative therapy, you can get stuck in a story or you can get stuck in um, a problem definition or whatever. So um, people get stuck in, in what reality seems like to them. And in these therapies that gets challenged and pushed. So another um, point is that client views are mirrored in the language they use in constructing their takes on reality. So this could be, um, you know, my child is such a pain, gets into everything, never sits still, I never have a moment of rest. So that's one story. And that's mirrored, you know, my language share, shares and kind of reflects some of the emotion I might feel about that. Another story would be, my child is so curious. He looks into and dis discovers, explores everything. I love his interest in the natural world. Totally different story. Maybe it's exactly the same behaviors that this kid is, is um, displaying, but the story that I tell as a parent 
feels very different. So that's a, a key for these. Language then becomes a therapeutic vehicle for altering old behaviors. Um, a quote from Steve DeShazer, as the client and therapist talk more and more about the solution they want to construct together, they come to believe in the truth or reality of what they are talking about. This is the way language works naturally. So um, that's just reflecting this idea of social constructionism that even in that the therapeutic system, as the language in that system shifts, then the version of reality, the vision of reality um, and of the solution and of getting to that solution can shift. Um, a couple of examples from this uh, little graphic on the bottom. So how can there be an objective reality that is what it is only because we think it is? Um, so for example, money and marriage, I'll take the example of marriage. Um, our idea of marriage in this day is different than it was 100 years ago, different than it was 200 years ago. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this. Um, used to be that marriage were political or um, kind of economic exchanges. Um, love and pairing because of affection was not a thing until recently. And um, so our whole idea of why we marry, of what marriage is supposed to be like, of what marriage means to us is different now than it was at an earlier time in that chrono system. Also, people from different cultural backgrounds may have different versions of marriage. People from different families may have different versions of marriage. So maybe in one family, um, the parents were just high conflict and they just were very passionate and fought a lot, but also loved each other a lot. And so marriage should look like that. And maybe in another marriage, uh, the parents are really conflict averse and they always agree with each other, whatever it is. And there's never a raised voice. And so if a child from each of those families marries each other, they're gonna have very different ideas about what marriage is supposed to look like that will probably be pretty stressful. And so in either solution focused or narrative therapy, being able to change the language around what they see, because you know they were attracted to each other. So maybe um, where now when there's some problem, the person, the person from the quieter family says, oh, that, you know, my spouse is so conflictual and gets angry all the time and, you know, all these scary things and the other person is a pushover and totally indecisive and withdraws. And so if they can change their story, maybe back to how it was when they were dating before they got into this marriage thing that they thought they knew what it was supposed to look like, turns out they had different realities. Um, so instead of um, conflictual and fighting and angry, uh, the more sedate spouse sees the other spouse as passionate and exciting and the, um, the more passionate spouse sees the more sedate spouse as grounded and um, even tempered, things like that. So that's kind of how this can work. Okay, so the creators of solution-focused therapy, Steve DeShazer and Insu Kim Berg. And as I mentioned, they started working together at the Milan Research or the Mental Research Institute. Um, and they developed their model kind of from a, a grounded theory approach in that they just watched lots and lots of therapy and tried to pick out little pieces that led to change. And so instead of kind of starting with this top-down approach of, hey, here's how I think it should work, they said, we don't know how it should work to create this brief therapy. Let's figure it out from watching. 
So thousands of hours were spent observing those behaviors and words that were part of the therapist that reliably led to positive therapeutic change were noted and were incorporated into this, the SFBT is solution focused brief therapy. Um, so as I mentioned in most traditional psychotherapeutic approaches, practitioners make an extensive analysis of the history, the cause of the client's problems before attempting to develop any part of a solution. So they're conceptualizing, they're pulling a lot of history and stuff like that. Um, Solution-focused therapists see that while causes of problems may be extremely complex, the solutions do not necessarily need to be. So conceptualization for these therapies won't involve the past so much, will involve the language, the, um, the stories, all of those things. Oh, that was completely unhelpful. Um, anyway, it basically says that, um, that they wanted to this, you know, this is brief therapy. They wanted to do what works best. And, um, instead of keeping people in therapy for a long period of time, they wanted to promote lasting relief quickly. Uh, oh, there it is. <laughs> yes. Okay. A little animation glitch there. Instead of getting rid of the problems, which... Okay, so this is Insu Kimberg, and she is describing, uh, just briefly, um, solution-focused therapy. So listen up, this is like a minute and a half, um, and it's a, just a lovely condensed solution-focused therapy explanation. Instead of getting rid of the problems, which is, we believe that most therapy models are designed to do is get rid of the problems. We will say, figure out what the solution is there already. And what is it their client needs to do more in order to get to the desired outcome or desired state of their life. That's the briefest description that's I can give you. That's the briefest description <laughs> I've heard. No, it's not enough to get rid of a problem because if you get rid of something, there's a hole there. I see. Mm -hmm. And if you don't fill the hole with something, it's, the problem will come back. And so the you, solution, the question is, what do you do instead of the problem? Okay. And, and I get the implication the solution is already there. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Well, how did this theory get started? How was it developed? Watching okay. clients? Yeah. Mainly, look, learn, develop whatever theory there might be here uh, from watching clients. And uh, they're surprising us over the years by doing things we didn't anticipate. That's sort of the basic format of how we learned all this. Okay, so um, I mentioned that I would just kind of briefly touch on this. Um, these are brief therapies. Strategic is another brief therapy. So with solution focused, the dysfunction um, arises because people are trying to solve the problem, but they get stuck in a particular mindset or view of things and because they're stuck there, they don't come to the solution. Um, that's the same for strategic. Um, strategic, they basically say the problem is what people, <laughs> that the problem is basically what people tried to do to make the solution, and that becomes the problem. So, for example, we talked about circular causality. That would be like, um, the wife is frustrated at the husband because he didn't take out the trash. And so she says, why don't you take out the trash? And the husband doesn't like to be told what to do and he feels belittled. And so he decides that the way to assert himself is to still not take out the trash, which makes the wife nag, which makes the husband do more of the same. And so that dynamic of 
you know, we're, we're basically, we've got a positive feedback loop. So the problem's getting bigger. That's where the dysfunction lies. That's what they say in strategic. Um, in solution focused brief therapy, the client is the expert, meaning that the therapist comes in with this stance of not knowing. Uh, it's like the beginner's mind. So there's going to be a lot of curiosity. There's going to be a lot of listening. There's going to be a lot of assuming that the client knows some important things that can solve whatever is the issue and create a solution. In strategic, the therapist is the expert. And I think of strategic therapy as being quite manipulative, uh, which I don't particularly like. Anyway, um, in solution focused, there's the sense that the client is capable of finding a solution. Maybe they don't know what it is and they are stuck, but as questions are asked, as new um, frames of reality are presented with new words and new language, it's that same reframing like we talked about with structural therapy, that solution that the, the client will say, oh, this is something I could do that would create the outcome I want. This is something I could do that would be one step closer to the reality that I want to, to have there be. Um, in strategic, the client needs help to fix the problem. And often the client is kind of treated like a pathetic child. I don't, um, <laughs> I'm sure that nobody who actually does strategic would say that that's, that's how they see the client. Um, but strategic, will often, so the therapist will say, ah, this is clearly what they need to do to fix it, but will prescribe more of the same or will prescribe. So for example, maybe um, the husband is really frustrated because uh, the son is not listening and being obedient. And so he gives the son a stern lecture for five minutes every day. Well, a strategic therapist would be likely to say, you know, I think that the five minute lecture isn't enough. Next time I need you to prepare an hour long lecture. So please give an hour long lecture every single day. And um, of course, at some point the, the client is like, this is not working and it's a lot of effort and I don't wanna do this anymore, which is what the therapist wants the client to get to. Um, it just seems a little manipulative to me. Anyway, um, with solution-focused brief therapy, the effort goes to changing perspective, to changing that sense of reality, um, the frame. With strategic, it's more focused on specific behaviors. Um, solution-focused, not surprisingly, is solution-focused, uh, meaning that there is a lot of discussion about what it's going to look like when everything is going well what it's going to look like um, when the, you know, the therapy is over and everything is fabulous. Strategic talks more about the problem. Um, solution focused says the solution doesn't have to match a specific problem. It's not like, oh, for anxiety, we do this. And for anorexia, we do this. And for depression, we do this. Uh, instead, it's like, what, what works for you? That's what you'll do more of. Great, you decide what works. Doesn't have to be a specific thing. It's uh, very client-centered. Um, strategic, the problem determines a solution. Um, Solution-focused brief therapy, the key doesn't matter. The why the door is locked doesn't matter. We're just gonna, we're just trying to open up this stuck door. You know, okay, you've got, you wanna get to the other side of this door. You wanna move forward and there's this thing in your way that you don't know how to deal with. We're just gonna try. We're just gonna keep trying and trying. Maybe we'll try kicking it. Maybe we'll try every, you know, the different keys in your pocket. Maybe there was something that you did last week that made the door wiggle a little bit. We're gonna try that again um, in strategic which is the same in most therapies. It's why is the door locked? Because if we can figure out why the door is locked, then we can get to the mechanism that will unlock it. Okay. So 
let's see here. We have here um, a little video about, um, about, again, this is solution focused therapy. And this, uh, let's see here, if I can get it started. I'm going to actually skip to, let's see here, right there. Okay. Hi, I'm Noam Royce. And I'm uh, Sue Kimberly. Welcome to our videotape, Solutions Step by Step. In this videotape, like in our book of the same title, Solutions Step by Step, Insu and I are going to show you solution focused therapy, solution focused therapy techniques in typical clinical situations with clients uh, who are harmfully uh, using drugs and alcohol. Let me say a little bit about the solution focused therapy. The most important characteristic of this model is very much future focused. Since we believe the future is created and future is also negotiated, we are paying attention to client's notion of how they want their life to be different. Um, what is their idea? What is their idea of how, what is the desirable way for them to be? Our uh, second point is, the, therefore, the client generates their own ideas about how they want their life to be. Oftentimes, when they meet the client for the first time, they have no idea because this is something they have never thought about. And they are very preoccupied about what has happened to them. And so through this process of a conversation with therapists, they arrive at, how do I want in my life that is not there right now? And so this is very important for those clients that we see uh, that are mandated for right. treatment, the so-called involuntary client. Right. Uh, these are clients that have been told over and over and over again uh, what they have to do, mm -hmm. uh, including that they have to come to therapy, mm -hmm. uh, highlighting their uh, homegrown experiences, their homegrown solutions is a vital uh, part of how this works. Right. So that brings us to the third point of the model, that is that we absolutely believe that clients do have strengths and resources and solutions. Oftentimes they have own solutions to their own difficulties, but again, they are not aware that they have these until we engage them in conversation in such a way that they will discover their own solutions and uh, that they do have, they do know what to do. Uh, the, the first point is because of this, the whole approach to working with clients tend to be very, very optimistic that they do, they can change their future, that their future is in their hands. They do know what to do about it. And as a result of that, uh, many clients tell us how respectful this approach is of them and of their ability. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it results in a very, very res mutually respectful way to work with people in some very tough situations. Well, Insu, we've got a couple of miles of videotape to show. Yes. Uh, what we've done is... Uh... Okay, so briefly, I'm just going to comment on what Insu just said. With that analogy of the door, and um, we care less about why the door is locked than how we're going to get the door open. Kind of following that analogy, one of the first steps is to talk about what's on the other side of the door. What are we trying to get to? And um, what she said, like a lot of times, like they know this is bad and I feel stuck and it's not good, but don't have a clear vision, haven't yet constructed the reality of what's on the other side of the door. And as that reality is constructed, then in this model, the construction of that reality kind of helps the client understand what to do to unlock the door, to get the door open. 
Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead again. Uh, we're just gonna watch this last. I do this could be helpful for you this afternoon. Sense with them. Uh -huh. What can I do this could be helpful for you this afternoon? What? So right here, um, the therapist is helping them, helping this couple construct a reality of what they want to get out of this session. So that first question was not what's wrong or what are the problems that you're bringing in, but what could we do that would make this be helpful? So assuming that the clients have a solution, assuming that they can create a reality about what they want uh, and opening the door for them to do that. I uh, had called to set up the appointment because um, I would really like to save our marriage. And I think we're really in uh, a lot of trouble. Um, Bruce has a problem with drinking and I think, I think he would admit it. Um, he's done some jail time. We were separated for a while. We've recently gotten back together. Um, so you're, and there's just been some problems. You're living together now. Right now, yeah. Right now, okay. Well, no. I don't know if, been, if we can continue. You've been separated just a, what, like a little bit ago? About four months. Yeah. You were separated for about four months, mm -hmm. and now you're back together for how long? Uh, a couple of weeks. Yeah, a short period. I just got out of jail. Okay, you just got out of jail. Mm -hmm. Now, was that the separation while you were in jail, or was that different? Uh, a, little, a little bit before that. A little bit before. So a little bit before you went to jail, you were separated. About three months before okay. uh, they put me in jail, uh, we were separated. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then you went to jail, and you're all done with that now. Uh, there are some uh, court orders that I need to follow up on, but yeah, I'm out of jail now. Okay. Okay. And you want to save the marriage? Yes. We have two children. Two kids. Um, two girls. Little boys, little girl? two, two girls. girls. Two girls. Two girls. Okay. Melissa and Heather. Melissa and Heather. Okay. Okay. How old are they? Um, Melissa is seven and Heather is five. Okay. Seven. Okay. Youngsters. They're, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, what um, what gives you the idea that uh, saving this marriage is going to be a good thing? <sighs> Well, we've been married eight years. We have two children. Um, we've been through an awful lot, and um, I, I, I still love him. But um, I'm asking myself the same thing. I'm asking myself, is it worth it? Okay, and you <clears throat> answer to that question? Okay, so... Um, it is interesting at the end that the therapist asks, I'm wondering why you think this marriage is worth saving. And, and she kind of assumes that he's saying, why would you save this? But what he's actually trying to pull out is what is good? What are we aiming for? What is the reality that we can construct in which um, there are positives? And so she says, oh, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm asking myself the same question, but he said, but you're here, like you've got an answer, what is it? So he's trying to help them see that vision of what could be. Uh, okay, let's see. So um, in solution-focused therapy, uh, some of the elements that are typical, um, first is the miracle question. So, the miracle question is a fun one. I, I actually use it um, in my therapy a fair amount, even though I don't do a lot of solution-focused therapy, but it's one of those interventions that you can use across models. Um, and you start by saying, I'm gonna ask you kind of a weird question or a pretty weird question, but stay with me. Supposing that I had a magic therapy wand and while you were sleeping tonight, I waved my wand and fixed everything so that your life 
was exactly the way you want it to look. When you woke up tomorrow, what would you see? What would be happening that would clue you into the fact that everything is now fixed, that this miracle has occurred in the night? And that helps the couple or the family or an individual start to visualize what they want. What's on the other side of the door? What am I aiming for? What is this reality that I am going to first mentally construct? Um, and that this miracle question is helping them mentally construct. It's also really good for having goals. Um, like uh, Dr. Berg said, the therapy or the client is the one that is creating the vision, creating the goals, creating what they want their reality to look like in the future. So helping the couple really identify that and envision that helps me as a therapist to know what are we working towards. That helps with goal alliance, with task alliance. Why are we doing this? It's because we're trying to get to that that reality that you're constructed in your mind that we're getting to. Um, so then finding exceptions. So let's say uh, well, my, we've got a couple and, um, or maybe it's now we've done a lot of couples, um, parents and a child. And the mom comes in and says, this child is so disruptive and so poorly behaved and never obeys and it's just a real pain and I can't deal with them anymore. Then the, the exception might be to find when does that story not work? When do things happen differently? When is the kid obedient? When do you feel close to that child? When do you see them doing something that you really appreciate? And so you're turning the mind, and again, this is about um, kind of doing some reframing, but also changing that sense of reality, that it's not an always thing. This one narrative, and we'll talk more about narrative with narrative therapy, but this one narrative doesn't define everything. So if you can find exceptions, like what happened when they were obedient. What happened when they were loving? What happened when you were feeling close to them? And then what can we do to do more of that, to create that? Scaling questions. This is another really fabulous one across all models. Scaling question would be, um, so often I'll, you know, client walks in and I ask, how was your week? Uh, it was okay. I cannot tell you how many times I get that was okay. And so I'll say on a scale of one to 10, where, or zero to 10, where zero is, I want to crawl in a hole and die. And I have people who are at zero, fair amount. And 10 is rainbows and unicorns and happiness. Um, where is okay this week? And sometimes it's like three is okay. And sometimes it's seven and that's great. Um, one of the things you can do with scaling questions in solution-focused therapy is to say, okay, um, if one is um, the lowest you've ever been, where this, the, this, this door, you know, or whatever it is that you're stuck with that is feeling so, so rough, where that is the very worst, that's going to be one. And 10 is going to be your vision following the miracle question, your vision of what you want your life to be like, of how you want things to feel, of what you see for yourself in this new reality. So if you're at a four right now, what's going to get you to a five? What could you be doing this week? What have you done that helped get a little bit closer previously? Or maybe going from a four to a five in a week is too much. Maybe we want to say, what would help you get to a 4.5? Or what would now, if, if this family is really feeling stuck, what would get you to a 4.1, you know? So you're helping them find solutions to make progress um, and you're scaling it so that it, you know, you're using language, helping kind of construct that. 
um, both and language is instead of it being all either or, um, it can be both and. So um, it has like when you don't, um, when you don't take out the trash or when you don't obey, um, I get so mad. Could be, I get mad, um, but I don't always get mad or I get mad um, and you also sometimes don't obey me, but it doesn't have to be kind of this follows that there can be some separation. Okay, reframing we talked about with um, structural also, but basically it's using words to suggest a different reality. And I gave an example of this already with, you know, maybe there's, so maybe there's another way of understanding that could be something that the, um, the therapist might say, might encourage the clients to come up with another frame of reference. Um, but if they can't, if they're pretty stuck, then maybe, you know, the, the mom says, this child is just so destructive and all over the place and has so much energy and runs me ragged and is into everything and I can't deal with it anymore. And the therapist could say, wow, it sounds like that's a really curious child. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to bottle that energy? Oh, I don't have that kind of energy anymore. Um, so you're reframing it. Compliments. Um, because this is a therapy in which language matters and realities that are co-constructed matter, um, being able to point out things that you see the client doing well is part of creating that reality with them. So, you know, maybe a mom is complaining, 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 complaining about her teenage daughter will actually see a session um, I'm not going to show you the whole session in this lecture, but the um, the video that you'll watch is in the content. Um, so, you know, she's complaining, complaining, complaining about the daughter and how the daughter never comes home on time and blah, 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 blah. And the therapist might say, I can tell you really care about your daughter. You really want her to be safe. And that shifts the focus, the change in language, the change in um, framing starts to shift that reality. And maybe mom remembers, oh yeah, I do love my daughter. <laughs> Even though it's hard sometimes, I really do, I do love my daughter. And um, then you can build on that compliment and have that compliment start to create this new reality. Um, reinforcing a client's power over outcomes <clears throat> that would be so like the finding exceptions and then reminding them of those exceptions and that they did something to create that exception and that they do have some tools they do have resources potentials for solution even if they weren't thinking about it and then focus 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 on positives and on creating that preferred future so um, one of the reasons I don't have solution focused as my main uh, model is that I, as a person, find it really hard to just be super positive all the time. I just, I do. It kind of feels like a cheerleader to me. <clears throat> and I often really do want to know why the door is locked. And that's important to me. So there you go. Those are some of my lenses. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to show you briefly this little video clip. You'll find it again, like I said, on Learning Suite. And it will say, use this for the reflection questions. So I'm just going to show you briefly what it looks like. It's not that I don't know how you feel. I know that you want excitement and you don't just want to be a boring, you don't want to just be boring. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to be boring. You okay. mentioned she has everything going for her. Okay, so it's that family. You'll find that. And then the first, oh, I don't know why those just disappeared. Yikes. 
Okay, here we go. <laughs> so the first reflection question, this is going to be a little bit different than past reflection questions where you got to reflect more on yourself. We're going to be now doing reflection on how you would apply this model. So don't answer all four. I'm going to say that again. Do not answer all four of those. Choose one, <laughs> just one to answer. Um, so you'll watch that clip and answer one of what is mom's current story? How could you help her see an alternative story? So that that reframing or seeing exceptions, things like that. I won't give you more, give away more, but what you might say in terms of that. Um, develop a miracle question to help the family in its present circumstances. So what would you say to them? And maybe what would they say? Uh, what is an exception finding question you might pose to mom and daughter to help them and develop and a scaling question to help the daughter re-examine her relationship with her boyfriend. So there you go. Uh, just one of those. Okay, so next we're going to move on to narrative therapy. Michael White and David Epstein met in the early 80s. I am guessing that is a picture of them from the early 80s. Uh, Michael White is from Australia and David Epstein is from New Zealand and they were at a conference where um, David Epstein was actually asked to introduce Michael White and after doing so listened to what he was saying and was just like, this, 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 this. So <laughs> he loved it and came up to Michael White and they began to collaborate and became brothers. And um, unfortunately, Michael White died quite young. I mean, sorry, Dave, yeah, Michael White, Dave died quite young. Um, I think David Epstein is actually still alive. Anyway, um, some kind of basics of narrative therapy. The interpretation of an event is determined by its receiving context and events that can't be patterned are not selected for survival. So let me clarify that. So interpretation of event, of course, is like something happens. How do I fit this into my narrative? How do I fit this into the story, the constructed reality, what, how I see myself, how I see the world, how I see my relationships? Well, if it doesn't work um, to like, I, I can't fit that in, or um, I don't know how to fit it, it doesn't work. It's, it might just be ignored uh, because what we look for as humans are patterns and we base our um, understandings of things off of patterns because that's essential for survival. So if it doesn't fit the pattern, we tend to just ignore it, which is not what narrative therapists do. They do not ignore what doesn't fit the pattern. They look for what doesn't fit the pattern. Okay, a change in thoughts and beliefs about oneself leads to the construction of a new story and a new discourse. The process of re-describing a story that incorporates unique outcomes is called re-authoring. So we'll talk a little bit more about reauthoring. Um, sociologist Irvin Goffman said, describes unique outcomes, which is when it doesn't fit the pattern, as feelings and experiences that do not survive the dominant narrative. They foster the possibility for alternative stories to form and become the predominant narrative in one's life. This reauthoring provides the client an opportunity to change beliefs and then behavior. Um, and then uh, this is another quote that I thought was helpful. Life experience is richer than discourse. Narrative. So in other words, there are these socially constructed realities, but sometimes we have life experiences that don't fit in those socially constructed realities. And that life experience is richer and it's a fertile ground for creating new realities. Narrative structures organize and give meaning to experience, but there are always feelings and lived experience not fully encompassed by the dominant story, which is great. We're not defined by what is normal, 
you know, um, we get to choose our own path, each of us does, and create our own realities. Okay, guys, I love poetry. And I don't know if you'll think this is silly. I started off the lectures with a John Donne poem, No Man is an Island. And this is a poem that Michael White and um, David Epstein, Epstein just really loved and they shared. And so I'm gonna share it with you. And they also said, felt like it, it was true to the spirit of narrative therapy. Let me hold your story and fill my hands with new sensations that I've never seen before, which have never existed, which I couldn't have understood without your song. They bear your name and trace out a road. Let me take with me a piece of our time together and savor the warmth a friend leaves behind. Brother of the sun and of time, who cares what color the wind is? We are joined by the taste of a dream of being hand in hand, holding a small piece, a bit of a world where you are allowed to walk at your own pace, to feel what you feel, and although different, to sing your own song. Let me take your conscious and leave taking with me the certainty that although we are different, we are alike, that the heart beats to the same beat, but your form creates a new rhythm. Let me learn your music and enrich my world with the look of your eyes and to find in your soul a new home. Brother of the sun and of time, who cares what color the wind is? We are joined by the taste of a dream. I just love that, it's so beautiful. And not only is it representative of narrative therapy, it, it captures some of the spirit of being a therapist too, of getting to taste other people's realities and hold their stories and to appreciate them for who they are and to try to help them be who they really are and to have that be okay for them. Just love that. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> okay, so narrative therapy, therapy uh, theoretical assumptions. Number one, our lives are socially constructed. And this just goes back to that socially con social constructionism um, that we're born into some stories, like our society has stories about gender and race and ethnicity and religion and marriage. And um, our families maybe have stories about how our life should progress. You know, do we go to school and then college and then a mission and then get married in the temple and you know that those stories are socially constructed and sometimes it can be really painful when our life doesn't fit that socially constructed story um, and that can feel like a, a shut or locked door but we get to construct our own reality other stories are constructed through our experiences of life and the meanings we attribute to them. So um, the, the meanings are really important in that um, how you interpret something is going to um, be dependent on the story you're telling, but also um how you deal with something so let's say you get really sick um and are incapacitated for a while so you could tell yourself the story that um god doesn't love you and isn't aware of you and now that you're sick and incapacitated you're no good for anything and might as well crawl in a hole and die. And the meaning of the sickness becomes, I'm worthless. Conversely, 
you could have exactly the same experience and tell yourself the story. This is an opportunity God is giving me to grow, to find new ways to serve, to find new avenues, to progress in my life. And I'm getting this because God chastens those who he loves and he gives them challenges so they will grow. And the meaning of this illness is that I am a worthy child of God who God trusts to figure this out. Same thing, but the meanings and the story are very different. And so, of course, a narrative therapist would help the client see a new story. Becoming who we are through relationships. Uh, we become who we are through relationships. We talked about this um, last week. Bowen had the idea that we kind of need to become who we are by being more differentiated. And then Mnuchin said, we are who we are because of relationships. Uh, of course, with the idea of social constructionism, there is that sense of that our relationships, our society shapes us to some degree. Of course, we also get to have our own personal experiences. Um, so we become who we are through relationships, through the meaning we make of others' perceptions of us and interactions with us. So more to think about. Oh, whoops. Okay. Um, theoretical assumption number two, we organize our lives through stories. Stories are linked, are events linked over time by a theme. We can make many different stories or meanings of any particular event, like I mentioned before. There are many experiences in each of our lives that have not been storied. So these are the kind of exceptions, the ones that don't fit the dominant discourse, that don't fit the narrative we have. And those are the ones that are rich with a personal experience to help us change the things we need to change in those stories. Each of those events could, if storied, lead to a different, often preferable life narrative. So um, that's why a narrative therapist is going to be asking about the exceptions call them the sparkling moments, I think, that it's like where things go, ah, you know, it's, it's different. Uh, it's you getting to step outside of that box and either get, get a different box, make the box bigger, um, or just not be in that box anymore if that story doesn't work for you. Uh, okay, stories provide the framework we need to give events and experiences meaning. The framework helps us attribute meaning and thus tells us how to react. Familiar events are given familiar meanings. New events are compared against an existing story to give it meaning. Every And so that can be like, um, you know, like with the example of getting sick and what's the story you tell yourself. Well, if you hear story after story about somebody gets sick and then they're just a worthless lump and they're such a drain on society and they're a burden, then if you get sick, that's probably the story that you're going to use to give meaning to the current events in your life. If you hear other stories like, um, you know, this person got sick, they were... Um, incapacitated in many ways, but kept learning, kept growing, kept finding ways to serve and give. It's really clear how God worked through them. They're such an example. Then if that's the story you hear again and again, you're more likely to give, um, to make meaning in that way. Every story consists of ambiguity. The longer the story's presence, meaning how long you have been telling yourself that story, about what makes you a worthwhile person or how your life should un unfold or um, what a specific relationship should be like or whatever, the more your life will be shaped by it. Another um, important thing about stories, and it's possible we'll talk more about this in a, a later week, but I'll bring it up here. Um, one of the research, kind of sets of research that's been done in terms of trauma is that um, being able to tell the story of the trauma 
again and again until you feel like it's you are the master of the story. And sometimes that also means that in your mind, kind of like like this, you know, you get to create the reality. One of the um, trauma interventions can be if you could go back to that time when you were traumatized and be there for yourself, what would you do? What would you give yourself? What would you say? How would you change things? And then that gives people power over their own story. And um, that can be important. Another thing that's been found is that children who are most securely or more securely attached tend to be the children of parents who are able to tell a coherent narrative about their life, which is interesting. So if a parent can tell the story of their life coherently and so, you know, this is what happened with my parents and here's how we handled emotion and then this happened and here are some relational dynamics, you know, they've got the story, they know what happened, then they tend to have um, better attachments with their kids. If it's really disjointed, which often happens because of trauma, then it's less likely for there to be a, a secure or healthy attachment. Okay, that was neither here nor there. Had nothing to do with narrative therapy, other than the stories really are powerful. <laughs> They really seem to be. Okay, um, theoretical assumption number four, the dominant discourses in our society powerfully influence what gets storied and how it gets storied. So um, a good example of this would be with the LB, oh my gosh, LBGTQ community. <laughs> I don't know why I just missed LGBT. My acronym, boy, my brain is not fully recovered from COVID, I guess. Anyway, uh, from the LGBT community, that those stories for a long time simply were not told. Like, it was happening. People have been homosexual for uh, millennia, I don't know, and transgender. And in some cultures, it is talked about. And in some cultures, um, like you might be two-spirit, that's a Native American word for it or um it, it just like in some hindu cultures the gods can have both male and female attributes and sometimes have both male and female um manifestations and so having somebody who was maybe originally assigned male and now is female is just not that big of a deal and you know people are going to be reincarnated anyway and you know, it's just a different story and it gets storied. And so in our Western society, um, for a long time, there were no stories about uh, people with you know, uh, different kind of gender expressions or gender experiences or different sexual experiences um, or identities. And so it kind of became taboo and bad. And um, now, as those stories are starting to get told, uh, that's changing. Uh, a discourse is a system of words, actions, rules, beliefs, and institutions that share common values. Particular discourses sustain particular worldviews. So, um, you know, we have kind of Western ideas about what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, what is moral and immoral, um, what a family should look like, although a lot of those are changing too. And the stories that we tell, the discourses that we have, which are societally constructed and change, you know, that, that chrono system pulls along, um, it changes how people see the world and how they see themselves and um, whether they think that they are an okay person or not. One might even think of a discourse as a worldview in action. Discourses tend to be invisible and taken for granted as part of the fabric of reality. But again, that's a postmodern thing. They question that fabric of reality. They say, 
why? You know, why do you have to, and this is changing, obviously, why do you have to get married in your early 20s and have three children before you're 30 and all these things? Why? Why? Who said that? And um, some, to some extent, that's changing. Um, but what gets taken for granted as part of the fabric of reality um, really is determined by what people say, what people think, what, what, what stories are being told in society, that discourse. And even what we think of as right and wrong, like, um, you know, polygamy, for example, you know, early church was terrible, scary, why would anybody do that? And then it became accepted. And then there was a lot of sadness and hurt and trauma because the church had to give up polygamy in order to become part of the United States. Um, and now we've gone back to, oh, we would never do that. But that discourse changed over time. Okay, theoretical assumption number five, locating problems in discourses helps us see people as separate from their problems. And this is another really important one in narrative therapy. It's called um, externalization of the problem. So the problem is about the story that's being told. The problem is about um, the assumptions that are being made the problem isn't a person. The child who is into everything and um, has much more energy than his or her parent and super destructive, the, the narrative therapist would say that child is not the problem. The problem of mom doesn't know what to do and there's always a mess that's the problem. The problem is the problem. The person is not the problem. And that's really key for narrative therapy. Once a problem is linked to a problematic discourse, we can more easily help people oppose the discourse or choose to construct their relationship in line with a different preferred discourse. Okay. Oh man, this is getting long. <laughs> I hope you guys can take a break if you need to take a break. Um, okay, so creating change in narrative therapy. Like I've said, um, change occurs by creating space for alternative stories to be present. So an alternative story could be a new reality about what's on the other side of the door, about what we're aiming for. It could be a new reality about how self is seen or what is right or wrong um, in terms of like, do I, am I a bad person? Is it wrong for me to, um, I don't know, go to graduate school or um, should I be raising my kids right now? But you know, the, creating that space for an examination of what stories have I said to myself that make something right or wrong? And is that the only view? And can I create a new reality? Uh, the therapist, and I think I mentioned this, this is the same for as solution focused therapy. Um, the therapist isn't the expert, but the therapist does help um, kind of co-author or reauthor the stories. And um, so if somebody is like, is just really stuck in their vision of reality and the stories that they've told, the therapist might suggest other possibilities um, and help the client see those. Like I mentioned in the last slide also, problems are externalized. The person is not the problem, the problem is the problem. Um, in the bonus videos in this week's content, there's um, some, uh, it's about half of an hour long of Michael White talking about his experience with uh, narrative therapy. And he says, you know, it's, it's amazing. We've done a lot of research and done a lot of therapy. And what we have come to is 
the problem is the problem. Isn't that amazing? And he's like totally making fun of it. But yeah, there you go. The person is not the problem. The problem is the problem. And um, that can be, you know, in systemic therapy, we don't see a specific person as being the problem. We talked about that um, as we were doing the, the systems theory stuff that, you know, there's something about the system. And uh, in this case, in narrative therapy, the thing about the system is the systems make stories. So um, deconstruction puts commonplace assumptions and realities under scrutiny. The therapist and client take apart the problem saturated story to externalize the problem. So what that means is, um, I don't know if any of you guys know about like deconstruction of, that's kind of a philosophy like deconstructionism also, but basically it means breaking it down and looking at what is going into this this view, what is going into this perspective, what is going into this reality. So back with the um, example of the mom and the young child, you know, the mom says super destructive, too energetic into everything. It's a disaster. And so the therapist could deconstruct that by saying, something like what makes you see that um, those actions as problematic or as, as um, uh, destructive and could it, is it possible that instead of destructive, this is normal developmental <laughs> or whatever it is. So, so that um, the story that gets told gets, questioned and challenged and examined and um, taken apart so that new possibilities, new angles, new perspectives are possible. Unique outcomes or sparkling moments. Um, and as I talked about, those are the lived experiences that don't fit within that dominant discourse. Um, aspect of one's lived experiences fall outside the dominant story and they are identified with the goal of having the client imagine a situation in which the problem cannot be accommodated by the dominant story. Meaning, you know, you're saying, let's say, uh, let's say we've got this teenage daughter and the dominant story is, oh, teenagers are so difficult and unruly and um, disobedient and they always talk back and that's kind of the dominant discourse about teenagers. And so again, might ask, when is that not the case? When have you seen your daughter be really a lovely person that you enjoy being with? Hey, that doesn't fit that discourse. Maybe could we change that story um maybe instead of my teenagers just difficult 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 it is my teenager um her brain is changing and she's going through new experiences and she's wanting to become more independent and i can help facilitate that and uh and maybe it's also mom mom's role is changing and maybe mom's story has been my uh has been my worth and my value and my role is to be a mom and to be there for my kids and to do things for them and now i've got this teenager who is distancing herself from me and that makes me feel like my story you know, I'm not being what I need to be in my story, my discourse about what makes me valuable. And so now maybe we get to explore what else makes you valuable? What other stories, um, what other experiences have you had that could create a new sense of your worth? And maybe your worth isn't just taking care of your kids, maybe there's something beyond that for you. So there you go, unique outcomes, sparkling moments. Reauthoring the problem, um, 
so the problem saturated story begins to create room for strengths, resources, unique outcomes, and then the stories surrounding that problem start to change. So when you look at maybe, you know, that that little kid who seems really destructive and full of energy and start to see, hey, that could be a strength. There, there's a lot of curiosity there. There's a lot of engagement with the environment. There's a lot of interest or passion. And seeing that in, in this new way makes space for an alternate story that identifies strengths and opportunities that the client didn't notice before. You know, maybe, um, maybe the mom asks for the kid to start showing her what they've been discovering or what they've been working on and gets engaged with the kid and starts to feel different about it. And then um, another thing that, that narrative therapists often do, because this is about words and creating reality together and kind of speaking things into existence and co-creating a new sense of the world and of reality. So they do letter writing and certificates to document new narratives. So for example, they might write a letter and say, I am so impressed by how your family handled this situation and you all worked together to create this solution and, and all week you did that and I acknowledge, you know, whatever it is. So, so it is being validated and there are words for it and the families sense of themselves and of their system starts to shift. Look, the therapist sees us in this other way and we can see ourselves in this other way because we're starting to make these changes. Um, a certificate might be something that you give at the end of therapy. It can be something like this hereby certifies that the name of the person um, is a first rate, like maybe this is for the kid, you know, the, a first rate scientist and investigator of the natural world. So they start to see themselves differently. And instead of seeing, you know, that destruction is a problem and, you know, I am, I am the problem, that those behaviors that were difficult are externalized and as the person starts to think about themselves differently, then they might change their behavior and still be energetic and still be curious, but maybe be thoughtful instead of destructive, stuff like that. Okay, so the last reflection question, and then um, there should be a reflection question. Hopefully, I will get in touch with Natalie about this. There, um, the, the model that she presents. Um, that presentation will have a reflection question too for you. But the last reflection question comes from this um, therapy clip, which is also going to be under content um, and on the schedule. And it will say, use this for the reflection question. So you'll watch it. Um, you can skip the first three minutes if you want to. It's about 14, 15 minutes long. Um, and share three total, so not three theoretical assumptions and three interventions, but three total things, either theoretical assumptions or interventions that you see evidence of in this session snippet. So just kind of paying attention to what's going on in this narrative therapy session. Uh, what is the therapist trying to accomplish? What are the, like, what are people saying that as a narrative therapist, I might pick up on um, like dominant stories or things like that. So here we go, guys. We are finally at the end. Holy cow, that took a long time. Um, hopefully you got a break and uh, I will see you guys on Friday for the lab.